Welcome to those who are joining us online. We're really glad to have you. Hey, remember, if you're watching us, that you can text in any questions that you've got any time during the sermon today. If you're watching live, we'll be able to answer those live at the end of the service. If you're watching um, on demand, then we'll get back to you as soon as we can uh, through that message app. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. The monsoon rains had come up pretty quickly, surprisingly. The rains were heavy enough to create a brand new river with one little island in the middle of it, and on that island was a little scorpion. The scorpion realized that as quickly as the river was flowing, as quickly as the river was rising, she was not going to make it if she stayed on that island for much longer. And so she called out to a passing frog, help me, save me. <laughs> the, frog, the frog was not coming anywhere close. You're going to sting me, the frog said. No, no, I won't sting you. In fact, if you rescue me, not only will I not sting you, I won't sting you for the rest of my life. I won't sting any frog for the rest of my life. It sounded like a pretty good deal to the frog. So the scorpion climbed on the back of the frog and the frog started to swim. Scorpion was rescued. When they got within shouting distance of the opposite shore, the scorpion stung the frog. And as both sank to their watery grave, the frog asked a simple question, why? And the scorpion, her answer was, I can't help it, it's in my nature. Fables have long been stories used to communicate a moral lesson. A lot of times they use talking animals, like this Russian fable. They teach something. Did you catch the moral of this story? We might put it in terms like the leopard can't change its spots. The destructive person can't change their nature. Jesus told stories too. Not fables, not talking animals, not morals. He taught parables, stories that used everyday illustrations, things many times he was just passing by that people would be able to look out and see or or something that happened right around them, something that people could approach and, and understand intuitively. But he used those stories to teach lessons about the kingdom of heaven, this new thing Jesus ushered in with his life his death, and his resurrection. And here in Mark chapter four, for those watching us, you can turn there because we're gonna be taking a look at that first parable that Jesus tells. Mark's not used to this. He doesn't usually write too much about what Jesus says. He writes a ton about what Jesus did, but these parables, these four in Mark chapter four, have especially important lessons for all listeners, you and I included as we think about and live in the kingdom of God. So this week we'll take a look at the first parable. Next week we'll pick up the last three. The first one is definitely the longest. In order to dig into it, we read it just a few minutes ago if you didn't get a chance to, Mark 4, 1 to 20, read through that. But I'm gonna put up on the screen for you the sections, the parable and Jesus' explanation. Jesus doesn't always do this with his parables, but this one he does. He puts both side by side. So I'm going to bring that up for you side by side, point by point. We aren't going to read it, but I'll put it up there to refresh your memory as we talk about each of the elements in this parable. And we got to start with the seed. If um, you drive in the country in the spring, outside of Green Bay, outside of the city, and you drive by farms while farmers are planting, what you see out there is nothing short of technological marvels. Those tractors and their implements represent a revolution in agriculture that allow farmers to uh, care for and tend hundreds of acres, thousands of acres, and in some instances, hundreds of thousands of acres, a reality not dreamed of a century ago. But for the sake of this parable, you and I need to set aside the mega machines and think more of a man 
walking his field, turning his tunic into a pouch with the seed inside of it. And as he walks along, he casts each handful accompanied by a prayer for fruitful growth. The picture isn't hard to grasp, is it? (laughs) He isn't laying out something complicated, which is nice for those of us who are a little slow in the uptake. Jesus makes clear, the seed is the word. And the farmer sows the word into all kinds of soil, soil that represents hearts, like yours and mine, like your neighbor Bob or your coworker Wannies. And he breaks those kinds of soil down, helps us understand what they look like. And he starts with the soil of the path, that hard-packed dirt. Matthew, who also records this parable, adds the detail about the path that it represents hearts that do not understand the message. And it's interesting, this soil, of all the soils, Jesus recognizes that, or he chalks it up, not just to the fickleness of the human heart, but he understands that the farmer has a mortal enemy who wants nothing more than to make sure that the seed never takes root. And maybe you've seen that enemy go to work. Somebody opens their Bible for the first time. Somebody comes to church for the first time and they've got all kinds of questions, all kinds of concerns, all kinds of worries and fears and uncertainties. But it's not long before they close the book, they walk out of church and they say, that's too weird, it's too strange, it's too too foreign, it's just, I'm, I'm just not a church kind of person. And in that case, The enemy, Satan, is all too eager to pluck that seed and make sure it never takes root. But it's not just the kind of person who opens once and only once or comes once and only once. The hard-packed path could be the heart of somebody who sits in church week after week, month after month, year after year, who opens their Bible regularly and allows those words to go in one ear and out the other without making so much as a footprint on the soil of their heart. And in those instances, Satan loves that there is a butt in the pew and a head that's anywhere else. That seed is ready to be plucked. The second soil is the rocky soil. In order to understand this soil, I want to take you back in time and tell you about a time when the church, churches everywhere, the church, was bitterly divided between two camps of people. On the one hand, were men and women, faithful Christians, who had stood the test. They had suffered persecution, and the government was inventive in their methods of persecution, They tried to torture the Christianity out of Christians. One of their favorite tools was the rack. Maybe you've heard of it. If you've seen the movie Braveheart, you've seen an example of the rack. Right before William Wallace is executed, they put him on the rack. It's this mechanism where you would strap somebody down, you would tie them hands and feet, and you would crank and you would stretch. And if you looked up the Wikipedia article on the rack, the torture device, you'd see the escalation, the excruciating escalation of joints out of socket, and then joints separated, and then muscle fibers so stretched that they would never contract again. The inquisitor would make the simple demand, renounce Christ, and in every no, the wheel would crank, and the pain would ratchet. And sitting in those churches were men and women who had survived the rack, faith intact, their arms hanging on the ground because they physically couldn't pick them back up again. And they sat in the very same pew as men and women who had folded under the pressure, who had seen brothers and sisters in the faith go on the rack and they chose a different way. So they signed the document. They gave the offering. They paid the tax 
all the pagan gods in order to get out from underneath the pressure. They gave up the name of Christ and here in the church they sat. Those who had taken the easy path asking forgiveness from those who had taken the hard one. Were their hearts rocky soil? Had the pressure of persecution withered their faith? Maybe you resonate. Your faith is so important to you. You dig into it, you love it, you love talking about it, you love sharing it until your boyfriend starts making fun of it. Church is like water to you. You can't imagine going without it. You make a regular habit. You go week after week until you get that promotion. And now you're just not free on weekends like you used to be. Your small group is life-giving. It's a place where you can pray for others, where you can ask for prayers, prayers that are close to your heart. But then the kids' sports season comes up and Well, there's just not time for building community like that anymore. And the sun has withered your faith. Then there's the third kind of soil, the thorny soil. It's the same destination, just a different way of getting there. If you were to come over to our house, you'd see that our yard backs right up to the woods and Right in that band between the woods and the yard grow these wild raspberry bushes, black raspberries they're called. And they're tiny little berries that turn dark purple, even black when they're ripe. We love them. We love to eat them. We love to pick them. And we hate them. (laughs) Because the thorns on those suckers, they snag clothes, they draw blood, they can send a two-year-old screaming for mom and dad. The thorns choke out the joy of the berry. So that most years, the squirrels get all the berries and we don't get any. Thorns are like that. They choke out the good fruit, the joy that we're meant to have. Jesus identifies three kinds of thorns in this section. Did you catch that? He says the thorns that choke out the word, anyone who hears the word is can be worries of life, deceitfulness of wealth, and desire for other things. We could dig into each of those three things and really mine what Jesus is saying there because he's not just, he's not coming up with something unique here. He's pulling from the depth of scripture. But in order for us not to turn this one sermon into a four-part sermon series in one Sunday, let's distill them down because they all come from the same place. The place is busyness. Busyness is roundup to the word of God. When you run, 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 run for work, run for your side hustle, run for your kids, run for school, there isn't enough room, not enough space for the seed to grow. And don't get me wrong, soccer is important. That networking dinner, it's important. Catching up with your college buddies is important. Scrolling social media can be a great way to relax. Watching an episode of your favorite show can be a great way to wind down at the end of the day. But are those things more important than the seed that's been thrown on the soil of your heart? If I were to look at your calendar, would I find any white space where the seed can grow? And busyness is all around us. Busyness is a thing that's rewarded. You get promotions at work for being busy. You earn the admiration of the other moms on the block when you're busy. And not busy is hard. It takes creativity and boundaries and patience. And let's be honest, nobody writes a book, makes a movie about not busy. But the seed that's sown cannot produce fruit if it's choked out by the thorns of busyness. And let's be clear what you are missing out on. 
to be clear what you're saying no to, what fruit is being choked out. The Holy Spirit writes it. He says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. They do not grow when they're crowded out. As hard as it may seem, if you want those fruit to grow in your life, you're going to have to say no to some things that might seem good. But keep the real fruit from growing because Jesus is clear in this parable. The thorns grow or the seed grows. They don't both grow. One wins. Which one's winning for you? And that brings us finally to the last kind of soil, the good soil. Notice the difference that this soil has. Jesus says it's the soil that hears, the heart that hears, accepts, and produces. This is the kind of soil that Martin Luther talks about in his small catechism when he explains the third commandment, the commandment that goes, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. He says, that he explains it this way. We should fear and love God, that we regard his word as holy and gladly hear and learn it. This kind of heart, this soil that gladly hears and learns the word of God that receives that that seed produces 30, 60, 100 times. Can you even begin to imagine the impact of soil that productive? and All that it might mean? It might mean that the generational sin that's been passed down to you stops with you doesn't pass on to the next generation. It might mean a wedding night filled with joy and connection and free of regret and self-doubt as you enjoy your new bride or groom. It might mean a life without regret that's looked back upon and is used to pour into and build up the younger generations. It might mean that you miss a promotion or two, but your kids know the love of their father in heaven because they experience the love of their dad, their mom. It might mean that you reconcile with your estranged mom, not because she's earned your forgiveness, but because God wants to grow something new in that soil. (laughs) The good soil, it's got exponential growth potential and it can change your world. It is the thing that, that can shape, that can grow. And it's so good, in fact, that when you start considering what 30, 60, 100 times might be, it might seem like Jesus is exaggerating, like it's, he's hyping it up until you remember who's sowing the seed. It was early on in the parable. We skipped over it because I want to talk about that farmer now. Every time we sing in church the song, Reckless Love of God, you know that song? I try to sing it, but you wouldn't catch it from the way I sing the tune. It makes me think of this parable. Because the farmer sows his seed recklessly. He's not careful, he doesn't discriminate. He's not saying, not that soil, that soil. I, need to, I can't throw it over there, I've gotta throw it over there. No, he throws it far and wide, again and again and again. He throws the, the, the seed into soil that hasn't produced for years. And if you think it's because he doesn't know, he doesn't know where the path is, he doesn't know where the rocks are or the thorns grow, you've never met a farmer. Any farmer worth their salt knows every fold and rise and nuance of their land. They know the high points and low points, the places where water pools. They know where the rocks are and where the weeds took over last year. They know their land like the back of their hand. And the farmer casts. One of this parable just keeps throwing seed. (laughs) And you gotta wonder why. Why would he keep throwing it in my heart when, when I'm honest? I reflect back on my 
personal devotions, and I see you so many times when I get done reading the Bible and I wonder, what, what was I just reading? I have to start back over at the beginning. He casts, even into my heart, knowing full well that I have been quiet about my faith, that I've been more concerned about what other people might think or say than I am about what my Savior has declared. He casts. Even when he looks into my heart and sees, more often than I care to admit, that I've worried about money, focused on the future, and have pursued stuff and experiences. In other words, the soil of my heart has been anything but good soil. He casts. Because he knows something about this seed, about the word, And you may not have caught it the first time we read this passage because it seems like a a weird thing for him to say right between the the parable, telling the parable, and explaining the parable. He says this about why he speaks in parables and why so many people miss it. He says, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Do you understand what Jesus is saying about the power of this word? When we hear and perceive, when we see and understand, this word has the power to transform the soil of our heart. The seed that will eventually produce a a, a plant first works a miracle and transforms pathy, I guess that's a word, pathy hearts, rocky hearts, thorny hearts, and to good soil, soil that's vibrant, life-giving. And so the farmer sows, and he keeps on sowing the word into you and to me and anybody who comes in contact with this word because he knows the miracle it can work. And your job is just to be in line of sight of the farmer because he'll take care of the rest. as he cultivates in you good soil. Soil that produces. That's his promise. That's his work. To keep on sowing the word in your life. Amen.